Let's go ahead and get started. First and foremost, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. My name is Abdul Nasser Jangda on behalf of Qalam. And I wanted to welcome everyone today to our workshop on the fiqh of fasting, fiqh al So as we're all aware, we're just a couple of weeks away from the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan, of course, is a very, very blessed month, a very blessed time of the year. We're inshallah going to be having more sessions online, which are going to talk about uh, the virtues of the month of Ramadan, the spirituality in the month of Ramadan, so on and so forth. However, Ramadan is also a time of a very, very profound and serious obligation of the religion of Islam. And that obligation is fasting. Right, we've all heard growing up about the five pillars of Islam and the testimony of faith, belief in one God, and the Prophet Muhammad being the final messenger of God, praying five times a day, and then fasting in the month of Ramadan. That is one of the five pillars of Islam. It is something that is obligatory, it is something that is mandatory, and so it's a very, very important part of our deen and our religion. And it's a very important part of the practice of a Muslim. So it's necessary for us to educate ourselves. How can we go about fasting properly? And how can we make sure that we are fulfilling all the rights and all the obligations and are not only just spiritually taking advantage and taking the blessings of the month of Ramadan, but at the same time, we are also making sure that we are technically fulfilling the obligation and the responsibility of fasting properly and appropriately. So now, inshallah, to be able to do that, we thought that we would have this workshop today on fiqh al the fiqh of fasting. Now, there's a couple of things that I'd like to um, explain right at the very beginning about the class itself today, the workshop itself, and how we're going to go about in doing this. First and foremost, number one, this workshop will primarily focus, there'll be a little bit in the beginning, but it primarily will focus on what we call fiqh, all right, Islamic jurisprudence, legality, technicalities. It primarily will focus on that. And so I'm certain that many of you, if not all of you, have different questions about how to capitalize on the month of Ramadan spiritually, how to be able to achieve as much as possible spiritually during the month of Ramadan. Particularly, of course, we are in a very unique uh, situation and you know a bit of a predicament. And so there's a lot of questions and a lot of curiosity, rightfully so, about how can we make the most of Ramadan during this particular time? And how do we spiritually approach Ramadan when it's in this type of a situation? That is a very good question. That is a very necessary discussion. And that is a discussion that we're going to be having on Sunday. So I don't wanna bore you with details about programming. I'll get to that later. But uh, Alhamdulillah, for the last couple of weeks, we have been holding a session online every Sunday night and every Wednesday night called the Qalam Hangout. Uh, you can view it online at, uh, on YouTube. We upload it after, uh, excuse me, you can view it online on Facebook. We upload it afterwards to our YouTube channel. We also uh, upload the audio recording of the Hangout to the Qalam podcast. Um, and so you can listen to them there. Ustad Abdurrahman Murphy, Mufti Kamani, myself, and sometimes other Qalam instructors as well, like Sheikh Mikail and others, we get together and we have a discussion about different topics that the community would like to know about. This coming Sunday, inshallah, for the Qalam Hangout, we're going to be talking about spirituality in the month of Ramadan, particularly in the situation that we are in right now. So inshallah, we're going to have a dedicated discussion about that. But today, we're going to focus on the rules and the regulations, the fiqh of fasting, number one. Secondly, even when it comes to the technicality and the fiqh of fasting, once again, I'm certain many of you have questions, very pertinent, very good questions. But in order to keep the session flowing smoothly, 
what we're going to do is I want everyone and anyone who has a question, I want you to write your question down. I want you to jot your question down at the end of the session, inshallah, once we get through the material that we have for the class today, at the end of it, inshallah, we will have dedicated time for Q&A where you can ask your questions, inshallah, bidnillah. So two things where I know if you have some discussions, uh, some questions or some curiosity about spiritual issues and scheduling issues and managing Ramadan in this situation, um, then inshallah, we're going to have a dedicated session for that on Sunday. If you have any questions pertaining to the material that the class is going to cover today, then inshallah, we are going to answer those questions, but we'll be doing that at the end of the session. Now, with that said, inshallah, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about fasting and how to properly fast in the month of Ramadan. First and foremost, terminology is very, very important, right? So we just kind of, we're, we're increasing our knowledge and we're learning about our religion. So the very first thing is that there are two words, asom and asiyam. Asom and asiyam, all right? Both of them refer to fasting. Linguistically speaking, the word som and siyam, they mean to abstain. Linguistically, it means to abstain, to refrain, to stay away from something. Technically speaking, Islamically speaking, it means with the intention made in the heart to abstain from things that nullify the fast from dawn, the break of dawn, what we call Fajr time, the beginning of Fajr time, till sunset, what we call the beginning of Maghrib time. So with the intention made in the heart, someone, this person is abstaining from the things that break the fast from dawn until sunset. That is the Islamic technical definition of fasting. Now, fasting primarily consists of two components. Number one, no eating or drinking, no consuming of any kind of food, nutrition, drink, water, no eating, no drinking of any type. Number two, no sexual intercourse. Now, allow me to offer a little bit of a disclaimer Whenever I make presentations, teach classes, particularly those of a technical nature, I try to use as appropriate language as possible. However, when it comes to technical matters, sometimes we need to know exactly what will violate this act of worship and what will not violate the act of worship. So sometimes there is a need to be more uh, direct, exactly, uh, more direct about what we're talking about. So. When it comes to the second item, no sexual intercourse, the re number, number two, the second note about that is that obviously that refers to married couples, married couples, right? If somebody, commits, uh, if somebody commits the act of sexual intercourse outside of marriage, it is haram. Of course, it will also break the fast, but it is absolutely haram. This is talking about even married couples, all right? If they engage in sexual intercourse, then that will nullify and break the fast. The third point is the reason why I'm being specific uh, with the wording there is because any other kind of affection, physical affection, physical interaction between the spouses, if they hold hands, if they hug, if they kiss, something of that nature, that does not break the fast. That does not break the fast. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. So I needed to be very, very clear and very direct about the fact that no sexual intercourse, because that will nullify, break, and invalidate the fast. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But those are the two main technical components of fasting, not spiritual, technical, that no eating or drinking and married couples should refrain from engaging in sexual intercourse. The next thing is timing. When it comes to fasting, what is the timing in regards to fasting? So the first thing is that we have to keep in mind is that the timing of fasting involves two discussions. Number one, that is how or when is the month of Ramadan? So the month of Ramadan itself as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْهُ 
So Ramadan and the obligation of fasting comes in with the ninth month of the lunar calendar, which is called Ramadan. And the lunar calendar, of course, as the name makes it obvious, it begins and ends with the appearance of the new moon. It follows basically the cycle of the moon. So when the new moon appears for the ninth month of the lunar calendar, then that is called the month of Ramadan, and that brings about the obligation of fasting. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in an authentic narration says, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi, that start fasting as an obligation when the month begins, the lunar month of Ramadan begins, and cease fasting when the lunar month, the ninth month of the lunar calendar, the month called Ramadan, when it concludes. When the next new moon appears, that is the 10th month of the lunar calendar, Shawwal, that tells you that Ramadan is over, you must cease fasting at that time. So that's the first thing, all right? That's the month that it is obligatory to fast. The second thing when we talk about fasting in the month of Ramadan is on a daily basis, what is the time duration of fasting? So the Quran once again says, Wakulu washrabu, you may eat and drink. You may eat and drink until the break of dawn occurs. The break of dawn occurs. You can eat and drink at night until the break of dawn occurs. And what that means is once it once the break of dawn occurs, the time of Fajr prayer begins, then at that time you must cease eating and drinking and you must initiate and begin the act of fasting. And then you continue fasting until the evening comes in. And what that's referring to is the setting of the sun. Once the sun has set fully, what we call the beginning of Maghrib time, once the sun has set fully, then you may now eat and drink once again. So once again, the month of Ramadan is the ninth month of the lunar calendar. And secondly, in the month of Ramadan, we fast every single day from the break of dawn until the setting of the sun. Now, when we talk about that, there's a couple of things that I'd like to uh, clarify when it comes to the timing of fasting in the month of Ramadan. And these are very important technical matters. So I want everyone to pay attention, listen very closely. If you are taking some kind of notes, then this would be the appropriate thing to note down. People often ask, how do I know that my fast started? Is it when the Adhan is called? I don't know. It depends on what your arrangement of the Adhan is. It depends on what you mean by the Adhan is called. If you are waiting for the uh, app on your phone to go off and tell you that it's time of Fajr, that, that Adhan app, I'm, it depends on when it exactly goes off. If somebody lives in, let's say, uh, a Muslim country where they call the Adhan from the Masjid and they're waiting to hear the Adhan, it all depend whether or not they call the Adhan at the beginning time of Fajr. So rather, what I recommend to every single person is have some kind of an app, have some kind of a schedule of Ramadan prayer timings printed out and look at the time where it tells you that Fajr prayer begins. So for instance, I'm going to use um, general numbers as an example because it'll be easier to understand. If the calendar tells you, if your app tells you, if the website tells you that Fajr time starts at 4.55 a.m., 4.55 a.m. is the beginning time of Fajr, then you must stop eating and drinking before 4.55 a.m. Now, if the masjid in your neighborhood calls the Adhan at 5.15, that's not the timing you need to follow you need to follow the beginning time of the Fajr prayer, which as an example, if the app, if the website, if the calendar is telling you it is 4.55 a.m., then that is when you start your fast. You must stop eating and drinking before that particular time. People ask the same question about breaking the fast. When are you allowed to break your fast, open your fast, resume eating and drinking? 
once again, is it when Maghrib time occurs? Is it when I hear the Adhan? Is it when my phone sounds the alarm? I can't necessarily speak to when the Adhan is being called in your neighborhood or the alarm is going off on your phone. Once again, what you need to do is you have the app, you, have, you see the website, you have printed out the prayer schedule for the month of Ramadan or Ramadan calendar, and look at the time where it tells you that Maghrib prayer starts. Look at the time where it tells you that Maghrib prayer starts. Once again, to give you an example, if the app, the schedule, the website, the calendar tells you that Maghrib time begins at 8.15 p.m., as a random example, if it says that Maghrib time starts at 8.15 p.m., then 8.15 p.m. is the time when you are allowed to break your fast, to eat or drink something, not before that, all right? So once again, you look at the beginning time of Fajr prayer and you stop eating and drinking before then. You look at the start time of the Maghrib prayer on the calendar or on the schedule, and you may eat and drink from that time going forward. So that is how the timing of Ramadan works and operates. The second thing, it's a technical issue, but I'd like to explain it to everyone because this is a common occurrence. And this is an issue that a lot of people run into. If you are eating and drinking um, at suhoor time, pre-fajr, if you're eating and drinking at night, suhoor, you're having your pre-fasting meal in the nighttime, and you're eating and drinking something, and someone comes and says that it's time for Fajr, the time has started. People say that I heard you're allowed to finish eating your food. What that means is the food that you already have inside of your mouth, the food that's already in your mouth, you can go ahead and swallow that food. But it does not mean that if you have a giant tray of food in front of you, that oh well, I guess I can finish eating my food. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. What that refers to is you may finish swallowing the food that is already in your mouth. But if you've got a giant jug of water sitting in front of you and you're like, well, I got to finish. My no, no, absolutely not. You have been informed. Fudger time came in. Fasting time began. Anything now you put into your mouth after that point down going forward, you are violating the fasting of the month of Ramadan. When it comes to the uh, time of opening and breaking the fast, the Maghrib time, if you are about to eat food and somebody informs you that it is not yet time for Maghrib and you have some food in your mouth, you must spit it out. You should spit it out. You must spit it out. Do not swallow. Oh, it's already in my mouth, I guess. No, that will in nullify and that will damage your fasting of that day. So if you already have food in your mouth and somebody informs you it's not time yet, take that food back out. Do not go ahead and swallow it. That will ruin your fasting, okay? Furthermore, one other scenario that I'd like to explain, and this one could be a little bit confusing. I want everyone to pay very close attention. If I'm having suhoor, which refers to the pre-dawn meal, the pre-fasting meal, so I'm eating and drinking, I thought that Fajr time starts at 5 a.m. But in reality, it starts at 4.55 a.m. And so I'm eating and drinking. And it's 4.59 a.m. But it's, and Fajr time came in at 4.55. The fasting began at 4.55. I thought it was five. So I'm eating at 4.59 and somebody comes and says, what are you doing? Fasting already started. It's already time for Fajr. And I say, I didn't realize. I thought it was five. He says, no, it's 4.55. In that situation, stop eating at that moment. And that food that you ate or that water that you drank after 4.55, that will not ruin your fasting. That will not ruin your fasting. You may continue fasting and your fast will be okay and will be valid. If it's due to an a honest to God misunderstanding, as we call it. It's an honest misunderstanding. On the flip side, if Maghrib time comes in at 8.15 p.m., the fasting ends at 8.15 p.m., and 
you were under the impression that Maghrib comes in and fasting ends at 8 p.m. And so at 8 o'clock, at 8.01, you drink water, you eat a date. Ten minutes later, somebody comes and says, what are you doing? Say, I opened my fast. And they say, it's not time yet. 8.15 is the time. And you realize that that is a fast that you will have to make up now. That is a fast that you will have to make up now. All right? So just note that down. What does it mean to make up a fast? We're going to be talking about that later, but note that down. So those are a few issues I wanted to explain that pertain to the timing of the fasting in the month of Ramadan. The next thing we're going to talk about very quickly, and as I said, while we're not going to talk a lot about the spirituality of Ramadan in general, but I specifically wanted to talk about the virtues and the benefits of fasting as an act. It's very important to note this. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu kutiba alaykum musiyam kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been mandated, obligated upon you as it was mandated on the people that came before you, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may develop a sense of God consciousness. It says righteousness there in the translation. That is appropriate. It refers to God consciousness, the awareness of Allah, the cognizance of Allah, being connected to Allah. Fasting is an action that can help you become very powerfully connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and can give you a very powerful spiritual connection to your Lord and to your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the first and the most important virtue and benefit, benefit of fasting. Furthermore, in a very beautiful, authentic narration found in Sahih Bukhari, the Messenger of God, Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Yaqulullahu Azza wa Jal, that God Almighty says, God Almighty says, so this is called the Hadith Qudsi, a sacred tradition, that Allah Himself says, as wa ana ajizibi. Allah says that fasting is for me. Fasting is for me. And so I, Allah says, He personally will reward the fasting person. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yada'u shahwatahu wa aklahu wa shurbahu min ajli. This individual gave up intimacy with his or her own spouse. They gave up food and drink and uh, uh, food and drink for my sake. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this person, the fasting person, gave up intimate relations with their own spouse. They gave up eating and drinking for my sake, for Allah's sake. And fasting is a shield. Fasting is a shield. A shield from what? Another narration of the Prophet ﷺ tells us that fasting is a shield between us and the punishment of the fire of hell. He goes on to say, That a fasting person will have two moments of elation. A fasting person will experience true happiness at two moments, two pleasures, two moments of happiness. Farhatun عِنْدَ yuftir, Farhatun hina yuftir. Excuse me. Wa farhatun hina yalqa rabbahu. The first one is when the person opens his fast. When a person fasts all day long, they gave up food and drink all day long. And then they finally sit down to open their fast, to break their fast. There is a profound sense of happiness at that moment. They feel a sense of accomplishment. They feel closer to their Lord. They really enjoy that simple food, a drink of water, a sip of water, a small date. Who knew that it could be so enjoyable? So that is the first moment of joy that the fasting person experiences. And secondly, and much, much more profoundly, the happiness the joy that that person will experience when they meet their Lord. 
when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they meet their Lord. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the narration goes on to say, that the smell that comes from the mouth of the fasting person, it is more beloved and more beautiful in the sight of God, is more beautiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than even the fragrance of musk. The smell that comes from the mouth of the fasting person is more beautiful to Allah than even the scent of musk, the fragrance of musk. And this is referring to the reality that when someone is fasting, that naturally because they're not able to eat or drink anything all day long, that there is a bit of a, a, a smell that develops within a person's mouth and in a person's breath. But that is a sign, that is a result of the sacrifice that that person is making for Allah. And so that sacrifice will be profoundly rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's more beautiful in the eyes of Allah than even the fragrance and the scent of musk. Now going on forward, I also wanted to very quickly highlight some other virtues and benefits of fasting in the month of Ramadan. Fasting helps us develop a sense of compassion and mercy. Because think about it, for many people who have not experienced severe, abject poverty, which is the majority of the people in the world, they have not experienced very severe, abject poverty, where you literally don't know where your next meal is going to come from. That when do we ever experience true hunger and thirst? You know, a lot of times I, I talk about this quite often um, in the community and with students that, you know, we use this phrase, oh, I'm so hungry, I'm starving, I'm so thirsty. But we use that as just a figure of speech and, and an expression, but we really don't know what we're talking about. But fasting during the month of Ramadan really truly allows us to experience real hunger and real thirst. And hopefully that cultivates within us a sense of compassion and mercy for our fellow human beings who are less fortunate than us, who might be suffering, who might be struggling. Number two, fasting also helps us develop a sense of discipline. Fasting also helps to cultivate within us a sense of discipline. That when we fast in the month of Ramadan, think about the level of discipline that that requires. The strictness that that requires. That you wake up, what a lot of people would call very early in the morning. Very, very early in the morning when it's still dark, when it's still nighttime. You wake up at that time. And then you eat and drink a little bit and you pray and then you go the whole day not eating or drinking anything and being very mindful and careful i'm fasting i'm fasting and again we're not talking a lot about the spirituality here but think about the spiritual aspect of fasting you're abstaining from any kind of sin from any gossip any backbiting anything negative and you go all day long and you read quran and you pray and then the evening time comes and you sit down and you make dua before you open your fast, while you're hungry and you just want to eat and drink, but you sit down early and you sit down and you make dua and ask Allah for whatever your heart desires. And then you open your fast and you thank Allah. Think about the level of discipline that it cultivates. Another benefit is identity. And what I mean by that is that fasting is something in the way that we do it, the month of Ramadan, 30 days consecutively fasting, is something so unique to the Muslim community. And it's such a unique practice of Islam that really cultivates this Islamic identity. And that's why some of the earliest and fondest memories that many of us have of our Islam is a lot of times from the month of Ramadan. The last thing is it says community here. Now, obviously, like I said, you know, we're going to be talking more, inshallah, on Sunday about the 
you know, a lot of the issues pertaining to Ramadan and the unique circumstance that we're in, that we find ourselves in. And it's going to be very challenging. So when, it's, when I say community, I don't mean it in the very traditional sense of community, like what we're used to in the month of Ramadan, where we go to the masjid and we congregate and hundreds of people and we break fast together and huge iftar parties and things like that. But it still does not mean that we need to be completely devoid of any kind of community. If we have people within our home, the people that we live with, that we're isolating with, we need to pray together, read together, worship together. There's a sense of community right there. And even right now, it's a great blessing of Allah that we have this technology, that we have this means. I mean, think about it. I'm here in Dallas, Texas, isolating. You might be in a different country on the other side of the planet. And while we can't, or, or you might even just be down the street. I'm in Arlington, you might be in Irving or Plano. And normally, maybe there could have been a class in a masjid and we would have gotten together and congregated. We're not able to do that, but still Allah allowed us to connect here. And so there is a type and a sense of community. And Alhamdulillah, once again, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this here, but Qalam is everyone here at Qalam is working very, very hard to provide you as much benefit as we can during this time. From the hangouts every week, the seer classes, purification of the heart. We have all these other courses and classes and broadcasts and lectures going on. And inshallah, bi'idnillah, we are going to continue doing that throughout the month of Ramadan, inshallah. But these are some of the other benefits that we are able to achieve during the month of Ramadan. Now, very quickly, once again, I'm a student of history. Ramadan itself, what does the word Ramadan mean? The word Ramadan comes from the root Ramada, which means heat or intensity. So some historians say because when they gave it that name, it was in the summer months, it was very, very hot because the lunar calendar shifts throughout the seasons. So they called it Ramadan or and there, another added benefit of that is that the scholars also say Ramadan refers to that intensity and heat because again, we fast during the month of Ramadan, so it's a very intense time and it also burns our sins away from us. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Now, when was Ramadan made fard? What that means is that when was fasting in the month of Ramadan made obligatory upon Muslims? So the scholars, Imam al-Tabari, who is a great historian and a scholar of the tafsir of the Quran, Ibn Kathir, rahmallahu ta'ala, another great historian and scholar of tafsir and fiqh and hadith, they write that in the tafsir of the verse that we looked at earlier, kutiba alaykum as that fasting has been made mandatory upon you, that they say in the second year of hijrah. What that means is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu spent the first 13 years of his mission. He received revelation at the age of 40. For the next 13 years, he conducted his mission living in the city of Mecca. He then migrated from Mecca to Medina and settled in the city of Medina. The second year that he was in the city of Medina, the month before Ramadan is called Sha'ban. On the 10th day of that month, so about 20 days before the month of Ramadan, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse mandating fasting in the month of Ramadan. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced to the believers that this year in the month of Ramadan, we are going to be fasting the entirety of the month. And from that point on forward until the end of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he fasted and instructed the Muslims to fast in the month of Ramadan. And from that point on forward, Muslims have fasted always in the month of Ramadan, but that is when it was instituted as a practice and a command from Allah. Now let's get back to some technical matters and issues. Who has to fast in the month of Ramadan? Who is obligated to fast in the month of Ramadan? So there are a few criteria which make it mandatory on someone to fast. Number one, the person obviously must be Muslim. Number two, the person has to be an adult. What we mean by adult in Islamic legal terminology is somebody who has come of age, somebody who has reached puberty, somebody who has come of age and reached puberty, right? Whether that be 
physically due to the physical signs of puberty, or at the age of 15, a person is automatically assumed in the eyes of Islam to be an adult. So they have to fast from that point on forward. Number three, mentally sound. And what that means is obviously that the person should not be you know, mentally disabled and therefore excused from the obligation of fasting. Of course, if somebody doesn't understand what fasting is, they're not mentally uh, capable, then they are not obligated to fast. Um, healthy, physically capable. All right. The fourth criteria is that a person must be healthy and physically capable. What that means is if a person is physically not capable of fasting, they have a medical condition. They have a medical condition that does not allow them to fast. Now, who determines how severe of a medical condition is? That needs to be asked of a physician, preferably a Muslim physician, so that they understand that fasting is not just some diet or a lifestyle choice or something like that, but that it is an obligation of one's religion. It is a very serious issue. Number five, a resident. What does that mean? It means that a person is not traveling. If a person is traveling, they are excused from fasting, and we'll talk about that later. But if a person is at home, they have to fast. And the last issue is a woman who is not in her days of menstruation or postnatal bleeding. What is referred to in the Arabic language as ayamul hayd or an nifas. Okay? So a Muslim adult woman who is in her days of menstruation, she does not have to fast on those days. She does not fast on those days. If a woman has recently given birth and she's experiencing the postnatal bleeding, nifas, what's called in Arabic, then again, she does not fast. So this is the criteria of who is obligated, mandated, and must fast in the month of Ramadan. The next issue is niya, niya. Niya in the Arabic language means making an intention, making an intention. First and foremost, there is no fixed verbiage, language, wording that is required in order to make the intention to fast. There is no verbiage, there is no language, there is no wording that is required for the intention to fast. Niya is an action of the heart and a person must have internally the intent to fast. That's the first thing. Second thing, making the intention to fast is very, very important and according to the majority of the scholars is mandatory, mandatory. So my recommendation and for the purposes of this class and this presentation, it is necessary to make the intention to fast. It is a requirement. Number three, when should a person make the intention to fast? Or rather, before I talk about the timing, let's talk about the preferred intention. What should be the mindset? What is exactly the intention to fast? A person must have, according to the majority of the scholars, there's some difference of opinion and disagreement by the Ahnaf, but according to the majority of the scholars, and that will be my recommendation to be on the safe side of things, a person must have the intention and must be aware it is the month of Ramadan and I am going to fast for the purposes of the month of Ramadan that I am going to fast as an obligation of the month of Ramadan. That is the mindset that needs to be there. The fourth thing is timing. When should the intention be made? Once again, the majority of the scholars are of the opinion. Again, there is some disagreement on the part of the Ahnaf, but the, uh, the majority of the scholars are of the opinion, and that will be my recommendation for the purposes of this class and this seminar um, once again, better safe than sorry for the better practice, the safer practice, that the intention must be made at some point between the Maghrib and the Fajr. So what does that mean? Let me explain. Right now is Thursday night. 
It is Thursday night after Maghrib. If I, if, if this was, as an example, if this was the month of Ramadan, and I am going to be obviously fasting tomorrow because it's mandatory for me to fast, so I'm going to be fasting tomorrow, then after I break my fast, I open my fast at Maghrib. At some point after Maghrib, before the fasting begins at Fajr time, at some point during this night, I need to make the intention that I'm going to be fasting the next day. I'm going to be fasting the following day. I need to make that intention. I can do it, and it can be made at any time. It can be made at any time. And what I mean by that is I can make it right after my iftar, because it's after Maghrib, so I can make it right after my iftar that I'm going to be fasting tomorrow morning. Or I can make it before I go to bed, go to sleep, or I can make it when I wake up for my suhoor, when I wake up pre-dawn, before dawn to eat my meal, I can make it at that time. It doesn't matter. At any point between the Maghrib and the Fajr when the fast begins, at some point during the night, I need to have the intention that I am fasting the following day. And a technical question that oftentimes people ask, and that is, what if I made the intention Okay, let's, let me give you a little example. 8 p.m. was iftar time. I had my iftar. I prayed Salat al-Maghrib. 9.30 p.m. was Isha time. I prayed Isha. I prayed Taraweeh. I recited some Quran. I went to sleep at 11 p.m. Before I went to sleep at 11 p.m., I made the intention, I'm going to be fasting the following day. The fast starts at 5 a.m. So I woke up at 4 a.m. to basically have my pre-fasting, pre-dawn, suhoor meal. I woke up at 4 a.m. But I already made the intention to fast before I went to sleep at 11 p.m. That's okay. Because my intention was, I will fast the next day. The fasting starts at Fajr time. So even though I made that intention at 11 p.m. when I wake up at 4 a.m. and I still got an hour till fasting begins, I can eat and drink at that time. I can eat and drink at that time. And that will not be a problem. That will not be an issue. So I wanted to explain that technicality. And another technicality is I have to, the majority of the scholars are of the opinion that I have to make that intention every single night. Every single night. So if there were 30 days in Ramadan, I will make that intention 30 nights, 30 times. There is some difference of opinion on the part of the Malikiya, the Maliki school has a difference of opinion. But once again, for the purposes of this class and this seminar, my recommendation is going to be make the intention every single night. Once again, that is the safer practice. The next issue I wanted to talk about is what we call Sunan of fasting. Sunan means recommendations. Sunan means recommendations. There are two very important, and again, there are many, many other spiritual recommendations. Like I said, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to have a dedicated class and session for that. But what I mean by sunan here is technical things that are recommended as a practice of fasting. There are two things. The Prophet ﷺ said, the saharu fa inna fi suhuri baraka. He said, eat something at the last part of the night before your fasting begins, because that adds great blessing to your fasting. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would always wake up before the Fajr time came in. And even if he had nothing else, all he had was a date or a sip of water, he would take that sip of water, he would eat that date, but he would consume something before the fasting began. So again, if we have the time, we have the food, we have the opportunity, we most definitely should do that. And the reason why I made it a point to talk about this is, and please forgive me if this does not apply to you, but a lot of times, I can speak for myself, a lot of times what deters people from doing the suhoor is sometimes there's a little bit of laziness, right? Somebody ate a lot before they go to sleep and then they just set their alarm for like, right at the end of Fajr time so they can wake up and pray their Fajr. And 
if you wake up for suhoor, you're waking up very early, you're having suhoor, then there's still 15 minutes until fajr time, and now you gotta wait that 15 minutes, and then you pray your fajr. And so a lot of times to avoid the, and please excuse me for the usage of the word, but to avoid the quote unquote inconvenience, it's not an inconvenience, but unfortunately a lot of times people to avoid what they think is an inconvenience, they might not wake up for the suhoor. The Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, always woke up for suhoor and recommended that we do as well and said it's a source of great blessing in our lives. The second recommended practice of fasting is iftar. Iftar. What does iftar mean? Iftar means that you break your fast. But the thing about iftar is the Prophet وسلم, says in the narration that my ummah will always remain upon good ma'ajjalu al-fitr as long as they break their fast as soon as it's time to break the fast. What does that mean? That means that if maghrib time, the iftar time is technically 8 p.m., you should break your fast at 8 p.m. Do not delay unnecessarily. There's no good in doing so. And there's a very profound wisdom behind this because this helps to prevent uh, the cultivation of an extreme mindset that the Prophet ﷺ warned us. He told us, He said, be very careful and mindful of not becoming extreme in your practice of the religion. So we do not practice an extreme mentality. We start fasting when we are told to. We stop fasting when we are told to. All right. It is an act of devotion, an act of obligation, an act of devotion and commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so those are two recommended practices of fasting that are very important to take note of. The next thing, let's talk a little bit here about some important terminology. There are three terms everyone should familiarize themselves with when talking about the technicalities of fasting. Number one is called qada. Qada. Qada basically means making up what you missed. Making up for what you missed. Number two is called kafara. Kafara. Kafara means, uh, technically it's translated a lot of times as expiation, but I will explain it as a penalty a penalty, penance, a penalty that must be paid. And third term is called fidya. Fidya, while linguistically means ransom, but for the purposes of our discussion here, I will explain it as it is a substitute for fasting. It is what is done in place of fasting. It is a substitute for fasting. Somebody who does not fast, cannot fast, they can substitute their fast by paying fidya. And what, who are those people? We'll be talking about that. Now that you know that terminology, let's talk about things that nullify the fast, that break the fast, that damage the fast, that ruin the fast, mufsidatu sawm, things that ruin your fasting. Let's talk about those things and those items. So there are two types. There are two categories of things that have the, that can nullify and that can invalidate your fasting. Okay? The first thing, um, so the first type of thing is, it says qada, but no kafara. Now we just talked about that terminology. The terminology was qada refers to making up what you missed or messed up. But kafara means penalty, but no penalty. So you do have to make it up for not having fasted, but you don't have to pay a penalty. Or you do have to make it up because you did something that ruined your fast, but there's no penalty to be paid. What are those things? Number one, vomiting intentionally. Now that sounds a little bit peculiar. What does that mean? Let me explain. If somebody vomits unintentionally, they just felt sick and they vomited, that does not necessarily damage and break your fast. If you feel very, very sick, that's why you vomited, because you are actually physically ill, you're sick, you're excuse, once you vomit, you're excused from fasting. You cannot fast the rest of the day and you will make up that day afterwards. However, however, if you threw up a little bit, but you don't necessarily feel sick and you feel like you could continue fasting, then you are allowed to continue fasting. 
But if you vomit intentionally, you make yourself vomit and throw up, you make yourself throw up, then your fast was ruined. You will have to make this fast up, but you don't have to pay a penalty. All right. Number two, if you break your fast due to a legitimate reason, if you break your fast due to a legitimate reason, what does that mean? What is a legitimate reason that you are allowed to break your fast for? So, for instance, if you are fasting and then you start to feel very sick, you become very physically ill, where you cannot continue fasting, you cannot continue fasting, then in that situation, you are allowed to stop fasting, drink some water, eat some food, take some medication. You will have to make up that day because you broke your fast, but you have no penalty to pay because it was a legitimate reason. Another legitimate reason is traveling. So I know that that's not very pertinent and relevant to a lot of most people right now. However, at the same time, just so that we generally are increasing our knowledge as well. If you were fasting and then you are traveling in the middle of your fast, while you are fasting, you end up having to travel right? You have a flight to catch, you get in your car, you have to drive. I live in Dallas, so I have to drive from Dallas to Houston, okay? That is the distance that qualifies as travel, way beyond that distance. Uh, usually scholars mention something between like 47, 48 miles that qualifies as travel. So I have to go from Dallas to Houston. I get in my car, I'm fasting, and I start driving, okay? Once I have crossed once I have left my uh, city limits, at this point in time, I am now allowed, it is a legitimate reason travel, I am allowed to stop fasting. But if I do stop fasting, I eat or drink something, I will have to make up that day, but I have no penalty to pay. Number three, smoking. I specifically made a point of putting this in here because unfortunately it is a common issue, but if somebody smokes while they are fasting, that will nullify the fast and they will have to make up that day. There's a difference of opinion, but uh, many of the scholars say there will be no penalty to pay. Some scholars did still say there is a penalty to pay. Allah knows best, um, but nonetheless, it will break the fast and you will have to make up that day. If somebody takes nose drops, or an inhaler, okay, an asthma inhaler, they have a nasal spray or nose drops, that will break the fast, that will nullify the fast, and the person, that will have to make up for that day. They will have to make up for that day, but they do not have to pay a penalty. They have to make up for that day, but they do not have to take, uh, they do, do not have to pay the penalty. The second category, the second category is qada and kafara. Remember our terminology here, qada and kafara. Qada means they have to make up that day that they messed up. And kafara means, and they have to pay a penalty. And they have to pay a penalty. So first let's talk about what, let's talk about what those things are that if you do them, you got to make up that day and you got to pay the penalty. And then I'll explain what is the penalty. So the first thing is eating or drinking. Eating or drinking. There's a difference of opinion. There's a difference of opinion on this issue that does eating or drinking deliberately, intentionally, you deliberately, intentionally ate or drank something while you were fasting, knowing that you were fasting, you know you're fasting, you know that eating and drinking, this is going to invalidate your fast, you realize what you're doing, and you still eat or drink something. Does that, at that point in time, invalidate your fast? Yes, absolutely. It breaks your fast, nullifies your fast, and it invalidates your fast. And you will have to make up for that day you will have to make up for that day after Ramadan is over. But the penalty, there's a difference of opinion. There's a difference of opinion whether or not you will have to 
paid the penalty or not. There's a difference of opinion whether you have to pay the penalty or not. Two schools of thought, the Hanafi school and the Maliki school are of the opinion that if somebody deliberately ate something or drank something while they were fasting in the month of Ramadan, then they will have to pay the penalty. The Shafi'i school and the Hanbali school, the fiqh of Imam Ahmad, they are of the opinion that if somebody deliberately ate or drank something while they were fasting in the month of Ramadan, that they will not have to pay the penalty. They have to make up for that day. They violated their fast. They have to make up for that day. However, they will not have to pay the penalty. That is, so there's a difference of opinion on that particular issue. I have it there in that list, uh, just because obviously, um, I personally practice uh, the opinion and um, I personally uh, practice the opinion that you would have to pay the penalty, but there is a legitimate difference of opinion and I thought that I would mention that. Suffice it to say, it is a very, very problematic thing to do, to say the least. It is a very bad thing to do and it will break and invalidate your fast. You will have to make up for that day. And then there's a difference of opinion of the scholars, whether or not you would have to pay the penalty or not. All right. The second issue is that sexual intercourse. If there is a married couple, if there is a married couple in the month of Ramadan, and while fasting in the month of Ramadan, during the daytime, while fasting, that married couple engages in sexual intercourse, their fasting is ruined, their fasting is broken, they will have to make up that day of fasting, and everyone agrees. All the scholars are in agreement because it's very clearly stated in an authentic narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that that person, those, that married couple will have to pay the penalty. Their fast is broken, they have to make up for that day, and they will have to pay the penalty. Now that we've talked about that, what is the penalty? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explains to us, once again, in an authentic narration, alluding to a penalty that is stated within the Qur'an as well for a different issue, but it's the same penalty. The penalty is sequential, meaning there is a penalty. If you are not able to do that penalty A, then you have to do penalty B. If you are not able to do penalty B, then you have to do penalty C. It goes in that sequence, all right? The first thing that the penalty requires, kafara, is freeing of a slave. You have, to free, you have to free a slave. That obviously is not relevant in our scenario, in our situation. So the next option that you must do is you have shahrayni mutatabi'ayn. Shahrayni mutatabi'ayn. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعِينَ that you have to fast for two months consecutively. You have to fast for two whole months. Two whole months. Now, lunar months can be 29 and 30 days, but think about the fact that what that basically means is you could have to fast either, um, you know, you could fast, have to fast up to 60 days consecutively. 60 days. You have to fast either 58 days or 59 days or maybe even 60 days consecutively. All right. It's a very severe penalty. And if someone is not like actually medically not capable of doing that, then the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, like the Quran also says, then you have to feed 60 people in need a day's meal. You have to provide a day's meal, day's worth of food to 60 people in need. Satina miskina. All right. Whatever that is. So if, for instance, 
where you live, the cost of feed, providing a day's worth of food for somebody would be $10, just to keep the math easy. Then 60 people would be $600. If it was $20, it'd be $1,200. So once again, it is a very serious penalty. So those are the things that nullify, that damage, that break, that ruin a person's fast. The next discussion is, we had talked about this earlier, and that is exemptions. Who is exempted from fasting? Who is exempted from fasting? Now we have two categories here. We have two categories here. One says qada, the other says fidya. Allow me to explain what that means. The first category that you see here that says qada, that means these are folks who are allowed to not fast on that particular day in Ramadan. They are allowed to not fast on that day of Ramadan, but they will have to make up the days that they did not fast afterwards. They will have to make up the days that they did not fast afterwards. Like the Quran says, uh, They will have to make up the days that they did not fast afterwards. What are some of those categories? What are some of those situations? Number one, travel. Number one, travel. Meaning, as I talked about earlier, somebody is traveling a far distance. They are allowed to then not fast, to stop fasting. But note the fact that if somebody was traveling for three days and they did not fast for three days, after Ramadan is over, they will have to make up those three days of fasting. All right, they still owe three days of fasting. So travel. Number two is sickness. I talked about this earlier. If somebody becomes very, very sick, I know it's a scary time out there with sickness and disease and illness, but just for the sake of an example, if somebody um, gets, you know, food poisoning, somebody got some kind of severe, you know, food poisoning or a stomach bug or something like that. And now they're just throwing up nonstop. They're very, very sick. They can't even keep any water down. That person is not capable of fasting. Let's say it took them three days to get over their sickness. It took them three days to get past the sickness. They are allowed for those three days while they are sick to not fast, even though it's Ramadan, even though it's Ramadan. The only thing is they owe three days of fasting. They're going to have to make up those three days after Ramadan is over, all right? So that's the second example, sickness. The third example, pregnancy, pregnancy, okay? If a woman is pregnant, a Muslim woman is pregnant, she is expecting a child. If due to her pregnancy, she is not able to fast, she does not feel strong enough to fast, then in that situation, she is excused from fasting. However, keeping in mind, however many days that she does not fast, she will have to make up that number of days afterwards. Afterwards. So if she did not fast this whole Ramadan, and Ramadan ended up being 30 days, she will have to fast 30 days afterwards. Number four, breastfeeding. If there is a Muslim woman who has a, an infant who has a baby and she is nursing her baby. And due to the nursing, she does not have the physical strength that is required in order to fast. Therefore, once again, she is excused from fasting. She is excused from fasting on those days. So let's say she, uh, there's a Muslim woman, she has an infant, that she is nursing and she doesn't have the physical strength to fast while nursing the baby. So she's not able to fast this entire Ramadan. And Ramadan ends up being 30 days long. She did not fast. She has 30 fasts that she owes that she has to make up afterwards. Okay. Furthermore, menstruation. We had talked about this earlier that an adult Muslim woman, obviously, 
she is fasting in Ramadan, and then her menstrual cycle, she is in her menses, she's on the days of menstruation, the days that she experiences bleeding. She does not fast on those days, does not fast. It's not that she's, ex uh, she's excused from fasting. No, she does not fast. The Prophet ﷺ explained that to us very, very clearly. She does not fast on those days. So let's say that that goes on for seven days. So she did not fast for seven days. She now owes seven fasts and she will make up those fasts after the month of Ramadan. After the month of Ramadan. The same thing goes for the postnatal bleeding nifas. Okay? A Muslim woman gave birth right before the month of Ramadan started. All right? She is now experiencing the postnatal bleeding, nifas. And that continues all throughout the month of Ramadan, for example. So she does not fast. Once again, she does not fast. The Prophet made that very clear. She will not fast. And now she has 30 days to make up that she will make up after the month of Ramadan. Okay? Now, one little side note that I wanted to explain here. Because... This question gets asked quite frequently, and there are a lot of questions about this. The question is that, particularly if you look at the third, fourth, and sixth issue that we talked about, particularly the third and the fourth, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and in some instances, even the issue of postnatal bleeding, that for, and especially for pregnancy and breastfeeding, if there is a Muslim woman who has had multiple children in close successive years, then that could mean that she was pregnant one year in Ramadan, so she wasn't able to fast. The next Ramadan came, she was nursing her baby, she was not able to fast. After that, she was pregnant again, she was not able to fast. Then the year after that, she was nursing, she was not able to fast. Then they had a third child soon thereafter, she was pregnant, she was not able to fast. Then she was nursing, so she, once again, she was not able to fast. That is six Ramadans in a row where she was not able to fast. And again, just generally keeping the math pretty straightforward, if it was 30 days, you know, in a month of Ramadan, I mean, we're talking about nearly close to, if not exactly, you know, anywhere between 174 to 180 fasts, right? She has a lot of fasts to make up. 170 something fasts that she now has to make up. Those are a lot of fasts, okay? That's nearly half a year of fasting, if done consecutively, which obviously I would not recommend, but that is a lot of fasting. So what should be done in that situation? Is there any kind of concession? Is there any kind of exemption? So the vast overwhelming majority of the scholars are of the opinion, the major schools of fiqh are all of the opinion that she still needs to make up those fasts. They need to be made up for by fasting. However, a couple of things need to be understood about this issue. Number one is they don't need to be done consecutively. They don't need to all be done, you know, right away. But she can basically take her time to make them up. Of course, spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, it is always better to do something sooner rather than later. However, it's not mandatory. So she can start fasting, you know, once a week and then just keep going. Now, somebody might say if she starts fasting once a week, then, you know, she might not make up all these fasts for three, four years. And that's okay. If that's all she's capable of, fasting once a week, then just get on the schedule and stay committed to it. What if she ends up dying before that? She will be rewarded for her intention. She will be rewarded for her intention. People are rewarded for their intention. And if she is able to make them all up, then alhamdulillah. So that is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. However, some scholars do recommend 
some scholars, excuse me, do allow, some scholars do allow, some scholars, that she is allowed to pay the fidya, what we're going to be talking about next. She is allowed to pay the substitute on behalf of the fasts that she has to make up. So if she has a hundred fasts to make up, she could potentially pay fidya, and we'll talk about what the fidya is, but she could basically pay fast for, she could pay the fidya for a hundred fasts. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next issue, the next category, fidya. Fidya means the substitute for fasting, the ransom, the substitute for fasting. What is fidya? How much is it? The recommended amount of fidya is very similar to the amount of money that is given for sadaqatul fitr, zakatul fitr, the fitra at the end of Ramadan. So we can estimate it at about $10 per person. $10 per fast. So the fitra usually is around $10 per person. So the fidya will be $10 per fast, for example. So if somebody has 30 fasts that they're not able to keep, that they are physically not capable of keeping, that they then pay fidya $10 per fast. So that will come out to $300. $300 that they will make a payment of $300 in charity. They will give $300 for the feeding of the poor and the needy. And that will be their substitute of fasting. Who are the people that fall in this category? Two people, two kinds of folks. Number one, old age. Very, very senior folks who now no longer possess the physical capacity to fast. And secondly is somebody with a very severe chronic disease. It says terminal illness. That's an example of one. But otherwise, somebody who's got some kind of chronic disease that is a lifelong issue and that there is not any kind of recovery expected from. There's no recovery expected from. So somebody has a very, very chronic disease that there is no recovery that is expected from that then they do not have to fast. Obviously, they're not even physically capable of fasting, but they will pay that fidya amount on behalf of every fast they do not keep. So if they don't fast the whole Ramadan, 30 fasts, then they will basically, $10 on behalf of each fast, $300 they will give in charity to feed the poor. All right? And what I was talking about with the pregnancy and breastfeeding, some scholars allowed that a woman who has accumulated multiple Ramadan's worth of fasting, that she could basically pay the fidya to clear all of her previous fasts. But as I said, the majority of the scholars are not of that opinion. Now, one last issue, and that is when we say somebody who's reached a very old age or somebody who has a chronic disease and terminal illness, they don't fast anymore and they can pay that dollar amount in exchange of the fasting as a substitute for the fasting, then what exactly is the criteria? How old is old enough? How sick is sick enough? That should be referred to medical experts. That should be based off of the advice of a physician, of a doctor, who says, you should not be fasting um, and you cannot fast. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention here before we go forward is, what if there is a very, very senior person, 80 years old, not physically capable of fasting? The doctor says, please don't. It'll kill you. They can't fast. But they also don't have enough money to be able to pay the fidya. They just can't afford it. They don't have that much money. What do they do? Then they don't, obviously, they can't fast. And obviously, they don't have the money. In that situation, they don't need to worry about it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa wusa'aha. Allah tells us, he does not obligate any soul beyond that soul's capacity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, understands and knows the situation of that person. And so that person does not need to worry about that issue. Now, furthermore, let's talk about disliked acts. And we're getting to the very end of the class and the presentation here, inshallah, so stay with me. What are some things that are makruhat? 
all right? That comes from the word kariha, makru, which means disliked. It means that these things are not they're not going to invalidate your fast. They're not going to nullify your fast. They're not going to violate your fast, but they are disliked. They are discouraged. The Prophet ﷺ told us to stay away from these kinds of things. And it can compromise potentially the reward and the benefit of your fasting. So you want to avoid this kind of behavior. It's mostly a lot of behavior kind of stuff. And a couple of technical things like we'll talk about. Number one, when I say it tastes like chicken, what I mean by that is you do not want to be putting food in your mouth, even if you're not going to swallow it. Now, somebody's going to say, well, I've heard that if you're cooking food, you're allowed to taste it to make sure that it tastes okay. There's a difference between saying that tasting it will not, will not violate your fast and whether you should actually do it or not. It is definitely something you should refrain from doing, but it just won't break your fast. Number two, chew. What does that mean? You, I don't have a prop here. I, I guess I kind of do, right? This is an Apple pencil, so not exactly the same thing. But you see some people, they're in the habit of chewing on the end of their pen, or they kind of like have a pen cap, and they'll just have it in their mouth, and they'll be chewing on it. Should not do that. The Prophet uh, told us not to behave in this way while we are fasting. Number three, don't be lazy. What does that mean? What I mean by that is do not, you know, a lot of times when you fast, you're not eating and drinking something, you feel a lack of energy. When you feel a lack of energy, it's very easy to just keep on sleeping. Don't just sleep through the whole fast where you miss prayers. You don't make dua, you don't read Quran. Don't do that. Don't be a baby. What I mean by that, don't complain. Don't cry. Oh my God. It's so difficult. I don't want to fast. Why do I have to fast? This sucks. I hate, God forbid, don't talk like that. Because again, you're being very disrespectful. And Ramadan is a sacred part of this deen and this religion. So do not be disrespectful. The next item is, says don't be a wudu warrior. What does that mean? It means when you are making wudu to pray, don't take water in your mouth and then start gargling it you know, with your head up, because then you're going to end up swallowing water. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right. The Prophet ﷺ, we actually see from the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, that when he would make wudu in the month of Ramadan, he would just lightly rinse his mouth out, but he would not gargle the water. When he would take water, when he would clean his nose, normally he would kind of pull a little water lightly into his nose, but when he was doing Ramadan, when he was fasting, he would not do that. He would just take some water and just kind of wet just the front part of his nostrils and that's it. Let's take it outside. What do I mean by that? I mean picking a fight. Do not fight. Do not quarrel. Do not argue. Do not debate. Don't engage in that kind of behavior in the month of Ramadan. That's not what that time is for. Those symbols that you kind of understood to mean bad words. Don't swear, don't curse, don't use foul language. Don't use foul language while fasting in Ramadan. The next item is, did you hear dot, dot, dot? Don't gossip. Don't talk about people. That's very severe. The Prophet ﷺ very famously says in narration, God has no need for the hunger and the thirst of a person who abstains from food and drink in Ramadan but then does not follow the etiquette of fasting. No marathons. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is don't physically engage in the kind of strenuous activity that could end up jeopardizing your fast. So don't decide to go running 10 miles. We live in Texas. All right. So there's going to be some days in Ramadan with 95 degrees outside. Don't go running 10 miles while you're fasting in 90 degree weather. Because then if you pass out and you have to drink water and all, you put yourself in that situation. Now, obviously, if you pass out, if you become dehydrated, you need to drink water now. You have to save your life. But just avoid that kind of behavior while you're fasting to begin with, that kind of activity. And then it's just toothpaste. What do I mean by that? And I'm going to come back to this. Toothpaste does not break your fast, if, as long as you don't swallow it. Now, if you're sitting there eating a whole tube of toothpaste, you have other things you need to worry about. 
But using toothpaste itself does not violate, does not break the fast. However, it's better to stay away from it because it's too easy to swallow something when it's in your mouth. Just a little, you know, slip. So you just want to stay away from it. So it's better to avoid it. Okay. The next item that we're going to talk about is things that do not break your fast. And this one, of the last items, inshallah, of the presentation. Actually, this is pretty much the last item. Okay. Things that do not break the fast. Keep on fasting. All right. What are some of those items? So I have a long list here. Okay. But we'll go through category by category. Okay. Number one, bodily functions. Okay. What does that mean? Going to the restroom, obviously fasting is like 16 hours a day, right? Going to the restroom does not break the fast. Vomiting, not deliberately, unintentionally, as we had talked about, will not break your fast. Your own saliva does not break your fast. I know that might be obvious to some, but you'd be surprised what people ask me on the internet. Nocturnal emission. Now, that's a really, you know, fancy sounding thing. That's a really big word. What does that mean? So once again, this is a little bit of a delicate issue. So please forgive me if this offends anyone's sensitivities. Um, nocturnal emission basically refers to if a person is sleeping and when they wake up, they find that they basically um, reached a point of sexual excitement or climax that they ejaculated while they were sleeping. What is oftentimes referred to in, uh, you know, just kind of like common language as a wet dream, but not turtle emission. That will not, that will not break a person's fast because it's not sexual activity, all right? Impurity, impurity. What that means is that, and again, this is, I'm gonna give a little bit of a delicate example, but stay with me. If there is a married couple, a husband and a wife, and at night, not during the fasting hours, not during the daytime, at night, they were intimate and they had sexual intercourse. They are in a state of impurity. They are in what we call a state of impurity, okay? If they went to sleep afterwards, they set their alarm, but when they woke up, it's now fudger time. They woke up, and there's not enough time to take a shower before fudger time starts and fudger time begins. They can start fasting and then take their shower to pray their fudger. But the fact that they had not pre-showered, the fact that they had not showered before the fasting began will not affect the validity of their fasting. The next category is accidental. What that means is if you forgetfully do these things, right? So if it's the first day of Ramadan, you don't realize it, you walk into your kitchen, it's 10 a.m., you walk into your kitchen, there's some cookies sitting there, you pick up a cookie and you start to eat it, somebody sees you and says, what are you doing? It's Ramadan. And you say, oh my goodness, and you drop the cookie. But you ate a bite. That's okay. The Prophet ﷺ, when the companions asked him about that, he said, keep fasting. Keep fasting, for Allah fed you but you're okay, your fasting is okay. Same thing with drinking. You keep a water bottle on your desk. It's the month of Ramadan, it's first day. You start sitting down at your desk to work. It's 8 a.m., 9 a.m. And you just instinctually pick up your water bottle and you drink some water. And then you realize you're like, oh no, what did I do? It's Ramadan, I'm fasting. That's okay. That's an accident. Keep on fasting. Dust. That means you're taking a walk outside or you're doing, you know, you go in your backyard or something like that and a bunch of dust flies and it goes into your mouth and your nose, um, then that did not break your fast, all right? Unless you were sitting there trying to eat the dust, which once again, sounds like there are other issues. Bugs, okay? Same thing goes for bugs, right? You're walking outside, you're standing outside, you're talking, and a bug flies into your mouth, goes to the back of your throat, and you swallow the blood, swallow the bug, all right? That did not break your fast. That did not invalidate your fast. Once again, unless you were intentionally trying to do that, 
which is really, really gross. Application. Okay, what I mean by application is applying something to your body. If you apply oil for, or you apply some lotion, some moisturizer, you like uh, uh, women folk, if they put on makeup or eyeliner, um, cologne, you spray some perfume or cologne, you put deodorant on. None of that breaks the fast. If you've heard, oh, but it soaks in through your skin and your pores and that breaks your fast, wrong. That is incorrect. Hygiene. Showering does not break your fast unless you're standing there in the shower with your mouth open drinking water while you're showering, then you're an idiot, all right? Then that breaks your fast. Otherwise, showering does not break your fast. Miswak, siwak, remember? So for those who might not know, the miswak or the siwak refers to a branch, a stick the Prophet ﷺ would use, and he would kind of cut and fray the edge of it, and would you use that to brush his teeth? Aisha Siddiqa, radiallahu ta'ala anha, the mother of the believers, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. She says, I saw the Prophet and I was counting how many times while he was fasting, he would use the stick to brush his teeth. And she said, I lost count. I lost count. So that also is what tells us that brushing your teeth would not break your fast. Medicinal, okay? These are medicinal issues that do not break the fast. Injections or IVs, if you receive a shot, you receive a vaccination, you receive a shot, you even get an IV. I understand some of us will be like, oh, but that's giving, you know, that's putting something into your body. That's fine. The rules of fasting are very, very definitive. It must be something that is ingested into the stomach cavity, uh, the, the organ of the stomach, something has to go in there. So receiving an injection or an IV will not break the fast. Similarly, drawing blood, you give a blood sample that will not break the fast. Now, if you end up, you know, they end up taking so much blood from you that it causes weakness and you pass out and you're fainting, then you have to break your fast because you're going to pass out and that's going to hurt you. So now you are allowed to break your fast, but you will have to make up that day. But if you just give a little blood sample, that does not break the fast. Similarly, blood cupping, the practice of cupping. All right. Hajama, what's called. That does not break the fast according to the majority of the scholars. There is an opinion, the Hanabila, they are of the opinion that it does break the fast, but the majority of the scholars are of the, fa of the opinion that does not invalidate or break the fast. All right, eardrops. If you have to put some eardrops in, that does not break or invalidate the fast. Eye drops. If you have to put eye drops in, that does not break the fast. Somebody has to take insulin shots that does not break the fast. All right. So wanted to clarify these things that these are not things that break or invalidate a person's fast. Wallahu ta'ala alam bis sawab. So that is a good understanding of the technicalities of fasting. Uh, those. So let me mention a couple of things here. First and foremost, the folks who have attended the class, if you would like to uh, go back and uh, you know review the class, you'd like to watch the video again, then the class is going to be recorded and you will be sent a recording of the class. So you will be able to go back and watch it. Um, you can feel free to share that recording with other people as well. What I rather recommend that you do is if you know anyone else who you think would benefit from this class or that they uh, would like to take the class for themselves, tell them to go to the Qalam website. The link for the class is still open. They can sign up. The benefit of that is that they are there then in this, it's a free class. As everybody who's on here knows, you do not have to pay anything for the class. But if they register and sign up for the class, they are now connected to the system. Any other recordings, any other resources that we share, we will be able to share with everyone who signed up for this class. And if you just forward them the recording and then we send more resources in the future, they're not getting those directly. So that's why the better thing to do is to tell them to just go sign up for the class so that they can get any other future uh, resources as well. And we're going to have follow-ups 
uh, to this particular class. We're going to have a class about the fiqh of giving zakat. That's going to be next Thursday. We haven't released the registration for that. The registration for that will be going out very, very soon. Um, and you will see that and you will be emailed about it. There's going to be a class on the fiqh of zakat, how to pay your zakat, because many people pay their zakat in the month of Ramadan. Mufti Kamani will be teaching that. We're going to be doing follow-up classes about the fiqh of taraweeh. How do you pray taraweeh? Especially because so many people are going to have to pray taraweeh, you know, in their homes this Ramadan. So what is taraweeh? How do you pray taraweeh? How do we do that? Uh, we're going to have these follow-up classes and courses. So inshallah, the best thing to do is tell anyone else who wants to benefit from the material to go and sign up. That's number one. Number two, the second thing I wanted to mention and I will not take a lot of time mentioning this. I'm going to mention this very, very quickly. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. If you took this class and you benefited, um, maybe you have already benefited from some of the other resources that we are providing and putting out. Maybe you haven't yet. Alhamdulillah, if you go to the Qalam website, you will find there, Qalam.institute, go there, you'll see. We are doing a ton of courses, classes, programs, broadcast, all completely for free. There is, there, are, there is literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of content on our podcast. We have an app that is completely free for iOS that you can download. We are doing classes and courses, emotional intelligence, prophetic emotional intelligence, the emotional intelligence of the Prophet with Sheikh Mikail. If you are an adult who never learned how to read the Quran properly, Ustad Ubaidullah, our Arabic instructor, is teaching a class on that. Um, you, there are kids for classes, Sira for kids. There are classes for teens with Ustad Fatima and Ustad Abdurrahman Murphy. Uh, they are teaching purification of the heart for teenagers. So we have all these classes, this class, Fiqh of Zakat next week, all these classes are going on for free. There are weekly broadcasts, the Qalam Hangout, the Tafsir class on Tuesdays, Purification of the Heart with Sheikh Mikhail on Wednesdays. Not only that, but in the month of Ramadan, we're going to be having free programs on the meaning of the Quran every single day throughout the month of Ramadan. We're doing all of this completely free of charge for the benefit of our community. All we ask you is to support us and help us make more and more knowledge free and accessible to people all over the world. If you go to supportqalam.com, supportqalam.com, become a monthly sustainer, and inshallah, you will have the reward in the Sadaqah Jariyah of making tons of knowledge completely free and accessible to everyone all across the world. All right, that's my little pitch. Inshallah, what I'd like to do now is see if there are any questions that anyone has. So what I'll do here is I will stop sharing the screen uh, so that it's just me talking to you all now. And let's see what kinds of questions everyone has. All right. Okay. Y'all have been busy in here. Okay. I answered the first question, which says that um, we will be sending out a recording, inshallah. Somebody said London. Okay, very nice. I'm very happy for you. Uh, somebody said New Jersey. Awesome. Good for you. Uh, what about laborers who have long work days and can't survive without water? Technically speaking, they still are obligated to fast. What I would say is this, they should start off each day fasting. If at some point during the day, they just feel like if they don't drink water at this point, they're going to become unconscious and faint, then they go ahead and drink the water and they have to make up those number of days. All right. Sister, uh, somebody asked a very, very good question, said that um, about nursing mothers, would it be acceptable to try one or a couple of days of the week? Or is that too arbitrary? No, that's not arbitrary at all. Because again, these things are uh, the Prophet says, 
The Prophet ﷺ said, the commands that you have been given, do them to the best of your ability. So if somebody wants to do that, absolutely. Um, kafara, we talked about the meaning of kafara. Kafara basically means penalty that is paid. And I explained that the penalty is sequential. Freeing of a slave, that's not possible. Fasting two months consecutively, and only and only if somebody's actually physically and medically not capable of fasting two days consecutively, then they can feed 60 people a day's worth of food. Um, someone's asking a question. This is a very, very good question, and that is about inhalers, asthma inhalers, that some people have very severe asthma, and they have to take their inhaler uh, just about every day. Would they never be able to fast in that case? Even on days of making up a fast, they might still need to take the inhaler. Would appreciate clarification. Uh, once again, my recommendation would be try to fast. If you're not able to complete that fast, take the inhaler. You do not risk your life. Ultimately, if somebody's condition becomes so severe, they're never able to go a whole fast without the inhaler. And therefore, as the questioner said, they're not even able to make up those fasts. Now they are in that chronic illness category where they will pay the substitute amount, the $10 per fast, in exchange of the fasting. Allahu ta'ala. I know that that weighs very heavily spiritually upon people. What I tell them is that there's a profound reward. There's an understanding that we have in our deen called at-tashabbuh bisa'imin. You emulate the behavior of fasting people. So what I tell them is you still go about emulating practically basically fasting you take your inhaler whenever you need to, and then you pay that amount to make up for that. Um, but you still are reaping the reward and receiving the communal bind because you're not eating and drinking anything. So you are still able to be a part of Ramadan and fasting. Wallahu ta'ala. Allah knows best. Um, there are a couple of questions about gum. Do not chew gum while you are fasting. First of all, you're going to end up swallowing whatever you want to call it, the juice or the flavor of the gum, and that's problematic. But even if theoretically it didn't have any kind of juice or flavor to it or whatever, it was like a piece of plastic that you were chewing, number one, ask yourself, why are you chewing a piece of plastic? All right. Number two, number two, um, if you are just chewing on a piece of plastic, that is still something that we talked about, does not break your fast but it most definitely is not befitting of the fast. And the Prophet ﷺ told us not to behave that way. Yes, when I said that part of the penalty is feeding a day's worth of meal for 60 people, that's not just iftar. It means two meals of a day. That's for masakin fuqara, like just feeding them. You don't have to do that in Ramadan. That's why it has nothing to do with iftar. Um, Somebody asked a very good question. Um, what if you see uh, bad things on your cell phone or laptop, etc., intentionally or unintentionally? Unfortunately, somebody looks at some lewd images or views pornography. Does that harm the fast or break it? Exactly. That spiritually is bad for the fast. But technically, you are still fasting in that situation. Unfortunately, you have spiritually done something very, very bad and terrible. Can you put water in your mouth and making wudu? We talked about that very lightly right at the front and rinse it out, but do not gargle water. Do not take it to the back of your mouth. Dental treatments. Once again, technically it's like, Somebody working on your tooth would not break your fast. But a lot of times if they're using the water and you know, you're gonna end up swallowing a lot of water. So if it's necessary dental work, if it can be put off till after Ramadan, do that. Ramadan is more important. If it cannot be put off till after Ramadan, it needs to be done right now, then you would just not fast that day and you would make up for that day afterwards. SubhanAllah. 
Somebody asked uh, blood transfusion or chemo treatment. Once again, um, if your medical condition is that severe, I can't really speak to it. Consult with your physician, your specialist, your doctor, and ask them if you should even be fasting. Uh, does fainting break your fast? Fainting uh, itself uh, would actually invalidate and break the fast, and you would just make up for that day afterwards. Sleeping does not, fainting would. What's the difference between nose drops and inhalers versus injections, ear, eye drops? It basically is about something directly going down your throat. All right. I mean, so there's some good wine here. I appreciate it. Okay, we're gonna be having a separate session about this, but I'll just answer it very quickly. Someone's saying, should somebody follow their masjid for Ramadan or Eid or Saudi? Also, could you expand on no marathon for disliked acts? What I meant by the no marathon comment was, don't overly exert yourself while fasting where you're gonna end up then sabotaging your fast. Don't do that. Um, as far as what kind of Ramadan calendar you should follow, um, do whatever your local community is doing. And definitely, especially in this situation, in general, uh, if you have family that you live with, make sure you're all on the same page. Uh, somebody asked the difference between vomiting unintentionally versus intentionally. Yes, if you vomit unintentionally, you could actually continue fasting if you didn't feel really, if you feel really sick, then obviously you're sick. You're excused from fasting, just make up that day. But if you vomit deliberately, intentionally, you make yourself vomit, then you have to make up for that day. Your fast is ruined and you must make up that day. Can someone make up another person's missed fast? No, they cannot. Physical acts of worship, nobody can ever do it on your behalf, right? Like prayer. Uh, difference of opinion about nose drops and inhalers. There actually is a little bit of difference of opinion. I should have been more clear about that. I apologize. The majority of the scholars say that it does break your fast. There are some scholars who say that it does not. Allah knows best. Okay. Someone's asking the question, what if there are many apps that have different timings, etc.? What I then recommend in that particular instance in case is try to whatever is your region or your locale. So I live here in Dallas, Texas. So let's say there's a masjid here in the Dallas area that is a reliable Islamic center. They have an imam who is a scholar. Um, so there's this Islamic center, the Valley Ranch Islamic Center, right? So just basically go to their website and just kind of follow whatever their timings are. That'd be my recommendation in your locale, in your region, in your area. If someone was sick for an extended period of time, let's say half Ramadan, for example, they just make up for the days or just do fit. Yeah, we talked about that question. Even if you missed a lot of fast, technically, you were sick for half of Ramadan, all of Ramadan, you technically still make them up once you get better. All right. Some scholars, I said, did say that they could just pay a fidya because it's become very, you know, it's kind of a hardship but that some scholars allow that majority still say you should make that up. Yes, okay. Uh, somebody asked a question that if it's early pregnancy and the pregnant woman feels physically uh, strong enough to be able to fast in Ramadan, um, can she still fast in that situation? Absolutely, that is up to her. That is her choice. That is her discretion and at best, at most rather, excuse me, based on the medical recommendation of her doctors or physicians. Wallahu ta'ala alam up. And then someone's asking that if somebody needs to pay fidya, um, if it's a woman, does is a husband, a husband responsible for paying um, if she doesn't earn? Technically, she has to pay, but her husband can pay on behalf of her, all right? Someone asked a very good question, and that is, what would you recommend for medical professionals right now who need to have strong immune systems? That is a very, very good question. Um, and that is something that we will talk about, inshallah, in uh, one of the future sessions, or we'll put out a video or uh, you know, some kind of answer discussing that because that's a very kind of day-by-day -day assessing the situation um, kind of question 
So that is something that we need a little bit more deliberating in regards to. Um, Someone asked the question that what if somebody never made up the fast that they missed due to their, like a woman, due to her periods, um, should that person now attempt to make them up even if it takes many years? Uh, or also, do we also have to pay? Once again, like I said, majority of the scholars, vast majority say you make those up. And just like I said, just get on the schedule and keep making them up no matter how long it takes. All right. understand that question someone asked a question that is it okay to wear like lip gloss or lip balm while you are fasting yes as long as again you don't end up eating it which is really gross um what if someone has you know, what if someone has a chronic illness and they forget to take their medicine during suhoor then again they need to go ahead and take their medication and not cause further harm and detriment to themselves. If somebody is phys considered physically weak and underweight and they have a kafara, the penalty to pay, they could be excused from the 60 days consecutive fasting, two months consecutive fasting, and then pay the amount instead. Coffee going. Yes, so somebody was asking about the fiqh of zakat class. It will be same time, um, 8.30 p.m. a week from today, inshallah, next Thursday. Someone's asking about how to be spiritually productive in Ramadan. Like I said, we're going to be talking about that in the Qalam Hangout on Sunday. Um, can you swim during fasting? Technically, yeah, potentially you could swim. But if you swim in a way where you're going to end up swallowing water inevitably, then that will end up, that swallowing of that water will end up potentially breaking your fast and you're gonna to have to make up that day. So I advise against it. Someone is asking a question about, well, I mentioned that a Muslim woman who is on her period that she does not fast and she will make up the days uh, that she did not fast afterwards, but prayers salah a woman does not pray while she's on her period and she does not have to make up those prayers she's just excused from the prayers of those days yes someone asked another question if a muslim woman started fasting and then during her fast her she started menstruating at that time she will she is not fasting and she will make up this day afterwards. Someone's asking a mouthful of unintentional vomit break the fast. No, that breaks the wudu, according to some, not the fast. Someone asked a good question. Is water or drinking just coffee at the time of suhoor sufficient for the blessings? Absolutely. Someone's asking a question about taking particular types of medication for certain reasons. Um, I'm not going to comment on it because, again, I'm not a medical professional. Um, so I prefer not to comment when there's specific types of medication uh, in question. Someone's asking about fasting from watching TV, movies, etc. Like I said, we're going to talk about that separately uh, because obviously I don't want this to go on forever. Okay, someone asked a very good question that because somebody was saying, can somebody else make up the missed fast for someone else? And I said, no, that when it comes to physical acts of worship, you do them yourselves. Somebody shared the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, it's an authentic narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then when somebody asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever died and ought to have fasted the missed days of Ramadan, one of his relatives, male or female, who is entitled to inherit from that person should fast on their behalf. That means more as a spiritual thing. But I, when I was answering that question, what I was saying is, I'm alive right now. I'm alive. And I was traveling three days in Ramadan. Can my brother make up those for me and while I'm still alive? No, not that. What that was talking about is somebody fell ill and they weren't fasting. And then they ended up dying from that illness suddenly then their family members can quote unquote fast on their behalf and that family member, the, the, the deceased will basically benefit from the reward of the fasting of their loved ones and their family members. But while I'm still alive, nobody else can be fasting on my behalf. Like they can't offer my obligation for me. So if that makes sense. Um, if someone did not wake up for suhoor and did not make the intention the night before, what do they do? The majority of the scholars say that's a problem. The Hanafi school says you can still make the intention before like 10 a.m. Before 10 a.m. What they call dahwa al-kubra, mid-morning. So like imagine 10 a.m. You can make the intention before that time. I'm sharing that because at least that will allow you to salvage your fast of that day. This session about the spiritual spirituality of fasting during Ramadan will be Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, it'll be broadcast on the Qalam Facebook page, on my Facebook page. What's the most accurate way to find out how many days were in the entirety of Ramadan, the last, uh, in previous years? Um, you know, uh, there's a number of websites that can, if you Google that, you'll probably be able to find your way to some website that will tell you that. Um, what age is it mandatory for kids or teenagers to keep the fast for the whole month once they've reached the age of puberty? If a person needs to pay the kafara but they can't afford it, what do they do? There's actually a hadith. There was a Bedouin man, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you have to pay the kafara. He said, I'm poor, I can't afford it. The Prophet said, no problem, then go. Just don't, don't, don't make that mistake again. Someone asked a question, what is a good way to answer to your kids when you're exempt from fasting due to menstruation and they ask questions? Um, how should you handle that situation? That's a very, very good question. Um, I don't know if I have a very good answer about that or not. Um, you know, um, maybe sisters with more experience and, you know, maybe if one of our, you know, ustadas, one of our female uh, students of knowledge and graduates could probably answer that question better than I could. Um, what I will generally say is that having kids, um, not quite being able to relate to that experience, but nevertheless, generally speaking, having kids is that there's usually what's referred to within the books of fiqh as well as sin tamiz As-sabi al-mumayyiz wa ghayr mumayyiz There's usually a, an age of um, when they're able to grasp certain things, right? When they're able to understand certain things. Prior to that, you know, usually it's not very fruitful to have, you know, those kinds of conversations and after that point, they reach an age when you're able to explain things to them. Allahu ta'ala. Someone asked a very good question. Can children pay fidya for parents? They aren't sure paid it and the parent passed away. Yes, I would recommend that they do that. Uh, someone's asking what age does prayer become mandatory on a child? Same thing when they reach puberty. Someone's asking if you have 60 fasts to make up, um, can you fast for Sha'ban, like the six days of Sha'ban, or do you need to make up those fasts first? Absolutely not. You don't need to make all of them up first. You can definitely still fast for Sha'ban. Somebody asked a question that if the menstruating begins before the fast breaks, even a short while before, technically speaking, uh, that person will have to make up that day of fasting.
Someone asked a question that can you um, make the intention to fast all the days of before Ramadan starts so you don't have to do it nightly? Like I said, the majority of the scholars do not allow that, um, but the Maliki school does have an allowance for that and does allow that. Wallahu ta'ala. Yes, someone asked a very good intuitive question. Doesn't everybody kind of subconsciously already kind of have the intention of fasting? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that's the whole idea. So someone's asking the question that I learned that you can only make the intention before 10 a.m. only for a voluntary fast. That's why I said difference of opinion. Majority of the scholars say you got to do it before Fajr time starts. The Hanafi school does allow it. Um, someone asked a question about combining the Qada intention with a Nafil fast. That is a technical issue. I have a very interesting opinion on that. I'm not going to get into that right now. All right. We'll talk about that later. Um, once again, someone's asking a question. If you're a healthcare provider and feel nauseated while fasting due to the N95 masks, is it permissible to make up the fast later or can donate to needy for missed fast due to the situation? That's a very, very good question. Like I said, we're going to specifically talk about some of these healthcare provider uh, related issues during the current pandemic and the obligation of fasting. We will specifically put out some information in regards to that. So please stay tuned, inshallah. How long do you have to make up uh, fasts uh, that you missed due to the menstrual cycle? There's no time limit. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the young girls of the Medina, she would tell them to make them up before the next Ramadan, but that was, she would just do that as a tarbiyah, as a good training. But technically speaking, there's no time limit. You have an open-ended uh, time to be able to make those up. But again, you always want to do those kinds of things sooner rather than later. Jazakumullah khairan everyone. Barakallah fikum. Thank you very much for attending the class and for sticking around for the Q&A. Like I said, keep up with all the other Qalam classes, all the other Qalam lectures, all the other broadcasts and the hangouts and everything that's going on. All the information is on the Qalam website. Qalam.institute. All right. Let me hear... Uh, trying to figure out how to use this. All right. Qalam.institute. So you want to go there, inshallah, and you'll find everything that Qalam is doing on there, free classes, a bunch of stuff. And like I said, inshallah, if you are benefiting from what Qalam is doing, then go to supportqalam.com, become a sustainer, and we can continue to do all this work for free and make knowledge accessible to everyone in the world. All right. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallah fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.